I'm Peter Kell, Commissioner at ASIC, and welcome to the FPA series on Bulletproof Advice. The financial relationship that clients have with an advisor can stretch over many years. One of the aims of opt-in is to ensure that clients get good ongoing service, that they're engaged over a long period of time, because after all, we're talking in many cases here about someone's long-term financial well-being. We want to make sure that you can have a good relationship with your client over the long term. Advisors have two options in respect to opt-in. One is they comply with the law and opt-in every two years with the client, and that's getting the client to sign a renewal notice every two years. Or they can go under the approved code option, which is to obviate the need for opt-in uh, and effectively complying with opt-in under another form. The reason for opt-in was that as a result of passive income, for where fees were being paid for little or no service. Now a solution to the opt-in has been either through legislation, which is a requirement for a two-year annual opt-in requirement for the client to consent to continuing paying those fees, or a class order relief option was, was provided through FOFA to allow for um, codes of conduct to be put in place uh, which obviated the need for opt-in. The code option or solution is, we believe, more flexible and more adaptable to professional practice environments. It allows the professional practitioner to negotiate with the client what those services will be, that they'll actually provide ongoing service, what those services will actually cost, whether those services are actually suitable, uh, and when they will be reviewed. And obviously at that point in time, getting the client's consent that they're happy to continue on with the services and the payment of those services. So we offer a flexibility and a, and a situation in which you're able to negotiate that with the client. In respect to obviating the need and the approval of codes, there are still some unanswered questions. There's a consultation paper at the moment from ASIC, um, and ASIC have, have put forward a number of options in which they consider to be potentially available for obviating the need. Uh, one in particular is a bit of a concern in, in respect to the removal of asset-based fees as one option for obviating the need for opt-in. The FPA doesn't subscribe to that and the FPA has put forward its own views in respect to obviating the need for opt-in. Uh, and our uh, solution, if you like, or principles in respect to that revolve around the engagement process of the opt-in arrangement or the ongoing service arrangement um, and the continued relationship and the suitability of those services. So number one, what, are the, what is the ongoing service relationship? Um, how much does it actually cost? Does the client consent to it? and when and how often will they be reviewed. In some ways that could be a natural part of what financial planners do and it will also depend upon where clients, sorry, where advisors are coming from. Um, in, in my case there's been some form of ongoing service contract which has attempted to define those services since the 1990s. Now others will have done something like that as well. So I think for those who haven't um, done that, maybe that's a good place to start, to start thinking about how they define what they're actually doing. It's a lot more than just saying we'll look after you for the year and uh, we'll have a review at the end of that period. I don't think it affects where you would start with the planning process because opt-ins to do with the ongoing service arrangement and, and the charges associated with that. So I, I don't think it really would affect the, the financial planning process itself. It, the the opt-in process brings to the fore though the details of the ongoing review service so that's where it's probably the biggest changes are defining exactly what that is, why it's suitable for the client and those types of things. I, I don't think it's going to be that difficult if you're used to having annual reviews, if you've got an ongoing service contract because in the end it's going to be some sort of confirmation from the client that they want to keep going with that uh, opt-in or they want to opt-in to that particular arrangement. I think where the, anyone's going to, everyone will run into some problems. Some clients are, as they get older will be forgetful, won't respond, they'll be sick, they'll be overseas and you'll run out of time and therefore things will stop after very started. There's a question of you know catching up on payments when you might have been providing services because not all services are provided face-to-face -face with the client. To some extent it will, um, but generally I don't think it's going to have a huge impact. It will impact those advisors and their clients who've charged and haven't done anything at all, but it's, it's not going to change the nature of advice too much, I don't think. The biggest change is the legislative one that's already occurred whereby trailing commissions, those types of things are being banned and that's what facilitated the um, payment without service 
type of uh, arrangement which has been contentious and in part has led to the FOFA arrangement. Look, I can understand if they've got a, a large amount of change to put through their, their business because they don't have ongoing services contracts in place, let's say, as a good starting point. It also would vary depending on the number of clients they have and what sort of market niche they're operating in. Now in the big cities it's a bit easier to home in on a smaller group of, of clients when you go out into the country areas. But to some degree it's going to be harder because they'll have a more diverse group of clients usually and they'll be smaller clients and larger clients and it's at the smaller client end where I think people are going to struggle with the mix of what services they'll be able to provide for what cost and um, you know what's economic, what's not, what works to keep the client, but they can't do a lot of service for the client if they're getting $50 a year, let's say. Most advisors probably have some form of ongoing relationship with their clients, so the first thing I'd be looking at is, well, what type of agreement do you have in place, if any? What are those services that you've agreed to with those clients? And how can you improve that ongoing service contract for your future clients? Is there enough information about services? Is it quite clear and concise about costs? And one way to prove this is can your clients recite back to you what, uh, if indeed they are in an ongoing service relationship, what those services are and what they're actually paying? As you'd know, under FOFA, you can belong to a code that obviates the need to satisfy the opt-in requirement. Uh, we're currently consulting with industry about what such codes should look like. We want to understand what are the sorts of requirements that people think are reasonable in terms of their ongoing engagement with, with, the, with the consumer that will satisfy that, that opt-in requirement? Uh, there are obviously some codes out there already that are being talked about. The FPA code is an example. Uh, but we want to get your feedback and we'll be out with some guidance in the new year as, as to how we're going to approach the whole code approval process.